reminder after the service here, we'll have the Lord's Supper, and so we need a few men that will help usher, and uh, appreciate that. Mark chapter number 9. Mark chapter 9. We were in the book of Mark for a few weeks, and then we stopped, and so I'm coming back and trying to just cover the rest of the book and uh, preach through some verses. I don't feel I'm locked in a series on it, but I want to just continue to grow from this wonderful book of Bible. Mark chapter 9, and let's pick up verse number 14. We'll read on through down uh, through verse number 29. The Bible gives us a story here. It says, And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. Before we continue reading, I just want to give the context. If you were here last week, uh, you remember that Jesus and three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, we often call them the inner circle, had gone up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus had revealed uh, just a glimpse of his glory before them, uh, began to teach them that he was going to go and was going to die for the sins of all mankind. Now he's come down from the mountain. And he finds his remaining disciples, the last, you know, the, the other nine. And a great multitude, a crowd is gathered around them. And of course, the scribes are there questioning with them. And straightway, all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed. And running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question you with them? One of the multitude answered and said, Master, I brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. Wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. Now watch this. And they could not. And he answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? And how long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long ago since this, how, oh, sorry, how long is it ago since this came unto him? He said, of a child. And oft times I have cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge you, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come to the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said to them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And with that, let's spend some time in prayer. Father, please help me now as I preach your word. Give me wisdom. Holy Spirit, would you make your word very plain to your people? Uh, would you make it very clear to your people? Uh, Lord, I pray that I pray that what I'm going to give to them today is exactly what they need in their lives. I know it's what I need. If I need something, chances are there are others with me as well. Father, just you be honored. You be glorified. You take center stage here. Holy Spirit, uh, we want you to work in our hearts. I pray as I, I did before, if there's any here in the auditorium or tuning in on the live stream or watching later on YouTube, I pray that if today be the day that they realize their lost condition and come to Christ, Lord, I, I pray that they would. I pray that they would. Please 
working this hour now, this time here. It's only you can. I ask the things in your name. Amen. We have quite a story here in the book of Mark. A lot of emotion. A lot of moving parts. A lot of different people feeling and experiencing different things. <coughs> After the disciples, the three inner circle, came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, let's, let's just try to recap the story here in, 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 our, you know, in, in our own words a little bit. They came down, they find this crowd gathered amongst the other nine. Of course, who is there, uh, you know, battering and, and, and bullying the other nine disciples? It's the scribes. It's the Pharisees. They have found something against which they can question the disciples. And with Jesus gone, what a golden opportunity. When we see what was the issue, there was a man, a father, a dad. He's brought his son who has suffered for many years with an affliction of a demonic spirit, a devil. He has had this, this thing dwelling inside of him and trying since a, ch a child, he said, a young child, since his childhood years to destroy him. Notice what the Father says to Jesus. He says that this thing has, uh, notice, um, oh, Oh, turn the page too quickly. He, he says um, that it has uh, tore, it says it teareth him, so it tries to do physical harm to him there. He foameth like a crazy man, he gnashes his teeth. And notice verse 18, he says these words, pineth away. And we don't necessarily use that too, too often, but it means he's dying. That's what he means. He says, my son is going to die. This spirit has been wearing on him. The spirit has been tearing him. He's foaming. He, 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 he's, he, he's gnashing his teeth. He doesn't have much time left. He says, I speak to thy disciple. I, I brought him to you, and I didn't find you, but your disciples were here, and I talked to them. I asked them if they could do something. They should cast him out. And they could not. They couldn't do it. They did their best. They tried. But there was no helping him. And of course, the activity of that moment drew this crowd together. They wanted to see what was happening. The Pharisees had found this thing to pick at. And Jesus answers. Jesus speaks. He says, Oh, faithless generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? That word, how long shall I suffer you? He says, how long will I be patient with you? How many times do I have to keep coming and helping this faithless generation? Jesus with compassion asks this father, how long? has been to this child. He says, to, to his son, he says, I'm a child. Now, we don't know how old this man is. We can assume, I, I believe helpfully, we can assume he's a young man, maybe 18, 20, 21 years old. That's my guess. My guesstimate there. So as a young child, we don't know what age, on through his, into his teen years, maybe now as an adult, it's hard to know, this presence has been attempting to destroy this young man's life. Cast him into water, trying to drown him. Cast him into fire, trying to burn him. And this father is at the end of his ropes. He's at wit's end. And notice what he says in verse 22. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help, help us. He said to the disciples, and I asked them to help, they could not. He says to Jesus, if you can do anything. If you can. I don't know if you can, but if you can, can you help us? Jesus adds now this parameter. He says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe. 
Uh, Jesus is not saying, you know, that we have blind faith, or uh, as James, can, you know, he deals with in his epistle, uh, we, we pray for things, we ask for things that we might consume upon our own lust. It's not what he's teaching around here. You know, he's not saying, well, you know, if you have faith that God will, you know, give you a Ferrari, you know, you're going to get a Ferrari. That's not what he's teaching. It's not what God's, you know, the, the, God's not a genie. He's not, you know, you rub a lamp and out pops three wishes. That's not how God works. But he's saying if you have faith to, to pray, if you have faith to seek these things, then God can do the impossible. That's what he's saying. I love his father's response in verse 24. Straightway the father of the child cried out and sent away the tears, broken heart. Lord,
he doesn't come through. And there's always that little temptation to fall back into fear and, and, and to step back and say, oh, maybe we shouldn't. My, we, the uh, deacon board and, and I, we've been uh, working on some, some upcoming plans for, for 2022. We, man, we are so excited. I can't wait to eventually share those things with the, with the, with the church as a whole. Uh, some some uh, ideas of what we want to do in 2022. And they're big things. They're, they're exciting things. They're wonderful things. They're things that are going to require a step in faith. And at, at times, I'm so excited. Like, praise God, we're going to do this. And, and we're going to see God do great things because we believe His Word. We're going to step out in the promises of His Word. At the same time, Brother Steve, I step back and I'm thinking, but what if He doesn't? What if He doesn't bless? What, what, if, what, if, what if what we want to do flops? What if it fails? I mean, what, 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 what is the church going to say? And I, I struggle with that. We, we, we all struggle with doubt. And I, I think we have a misconception about faith sometimes. Sometimes we think of faith and, and people who had great faith, and we think that faith is this, this virtue welling up only in spectacular people, that they are just that great and that awesome, that wonderful, that their faith is that strong. And that's not quite how faith works. That's not what faith is. We know faith is the evidence of things, hope, the substance rather of things so forth, the evidence of things not seen. But if I can add to that definition the Bible gives, we could say this. Faith is not an exercise of how good we are. Rather, it is a recognition of how we are not enough. Let me say that again. Faith is not an exercise of how good we are. It's not a virtue of, like, of being a spectacular person. But rather, it is a recognition that we are not enough. That's what faith is. I think the Hebrew children, uh, I don't know why we call them the Hebrew children, they were young adults by this time, cast in the fiery furnace. They say, our God can deliver us from your hand, but if not, we believe he can, we trust he can, and either way, we're not going to bow down, we're not going to, we're not going to, Capitulate to your, your will, O King. We're just going to trust Him. We're not enough in this moment. We're not enough in this time. We're, every, 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 everything we've got, everything is laid on His hands at this moment. That's what faith is saying. It's saying, I realize at this moment in time, I am not sufficient in my own ability, so I'm going to cast every bit of my trust on the one who is. And that's faith. That's faith. And so when we look at great men in the Bible, we look at Daniel, we look at uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or, you know, as you, if you know their, their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We look at men like uh, 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 Moses. We look at men like Gideon. All of those men, at times, struggled with doubt. <coughs> All of those men, at times, even if it's not written down for us, struggled with fear. Struggled with this, this, this nag in the back of their head. I think of Peter. And we, we sometimes pick on Peter because we say, well, Peter, you know, he stepped out of the boat, but he got his eyes on the storm. Yeah, he got his eyes on the storm, but he stepped out of the boat. <laughs> Jesus comes walking to, to the disciples on the water. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me that I can come to you on the water. How many of us would have actually got out? I mean, Peter was a seasoned fisherman. He knew what it meant to fall into the water in a storm. It wasn't a safe situation. It wasn't this grand situation. And he stepped out in great faith, but as soon as he got his eyes on the storm, he began to sink. He struggled with doubt. He struggled with fear. I think of Gideon. Gideon, in the Old Testament, the angel appears to Gideon and says, Hail, thou mighty man of valor. What was he doing at that very moment? Hiding. For fear of the Midianites, the people that he's supposed to lead his nation in battle against, he is hiding for fear. Think of David. David who slew Goliath. David, this, this incredible 
incredible champion of the faith. Read through some of his songs. Talk about fear. Talk about doubt. Talk about that inner conversation, that inner turmoil. Read the Psalms. He lays it out so often. We all struggle with doubt. I see in the story itself there are different people with struggle, who struggle with unbelief in different in, in different areas and for different reasons. The disciples, the nine were there. Uh, they struggled with unbelief, I believe, from self-reliance. If we were to go back in Matthew chapter 17, we find Jesus commissioning his disciples uh, to go out. This was before this event. He sends them out to preach in the villages and the cities. He gives them an early opportunity for ministry. And he also gives them the ability to do miracles. He gives them the ability to cast out devils. This wasn't something they'd never done before. What I believe is what happened is they... They, they got wrapped up in this, what we can do. This is our ability. And Jesus lays it out. He says, this kind cometh not but by prayer and fasting. Prayer is a recognition of our dependence, a recognition of our need. Fasting is to humble the soul before God. I believe the disciples thought, you know, this guy's coming to me. He's got a problem. He's got a son. He's got a devil. Here we go. Let's do it. I got it. We saw it this morning as we looked through the book of James of boasting in our own abilities. All such boasting is evil. When we have self-reliance, we have unbelief in God. To believe in the ability of ourselves and ourselves and our own strength is to reject this power and need for God. Jesus said, without me, ye can do what? Jack Diddley squat. Nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Jesus did not say in John, without me, you can do some things. Without me, you can do a few things. He said, without me, you can do nothing. I believe the disciples got caught up in, well, this is what I'm able to do. And so for that reason, they suffered with unbelief. They suffered with doubt. I see the crowd, they had an unbelief from rejection. Unbelief from rejection. That's why Jesus made the statement. He said, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? When Jesus came, he did miracles. The multitude followed him. But they didn't follow him because they were disciples, because they were believing in him, and because they were walking with him as disciples. They followed him because they were fans. They jumped on the bandwagon. They saw the excitement and the hype of the moment. They saw him feed the 5,000 and thought, man, this guy can give us bread. This guy has a free meal. I'm not following him. <clears throat> but you read through the book of John, Jesus gave some very hard statements to weed out those that were disciples and those that were not. Very difficult and offensive things that were hard to be understood, Jesus said. He said, if you be my disciple, you must eat my flesh, drink my blood. That's kind of off-putting. We know he is given a metaphor. You must, you must, you know, be willing to identify with my death, burial, and resurrection. You must be willing to believe that I am going to die and raise again from the grave if you be my disciple. And you must be willing to take up your cross and follow me. But for the average person in the crowd, they weren't looking for that. See, they had their own concept, you know, their own idea of what the Messiah was supposed to be. In their minds, in the mind of the average Jew of Jesus' day, the Messiah was going to be this great conquering military leader that was going <clears> to <throat> lead them in, in war against Rome and set up his earthly kingdom. They missed all the Old Testament prophecies about how Messiah was going to die. They missed all the Old Testament prophecies of him coming humbly uh, in, in, from Bethlehem. They missed all of those things. They just looked for a king that would give them immediate earthly gratification. And when Jesus was not what they wanted, they rejected him. <clears throat> How often does this world do this? They want, we, want, we want to put God in our box. And we want to define God on our terms. And when God 
God doesn't fit our narrative, when God doesn't fit our box, we reject him. We say he doesn't exist. Maybe you're here this morning or you're tuning in on the live stream and that's where you've been. You've been rejecting the very Son of God because he doesn't fit your parameters, your, your, your box. God doesn't need to fit our box. We need to accept him for who he is. He gave his life for us that we might have eternal life. He, God, stepped out of eternity, took on the form of man in Jesus Christ, lived a perfect and sinless life, gave his own self as a ransom. He said, I'm giving my life. I'm not getting it taken from me. I lay it up myself. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Jesus came to die that we might through him have life. We didn't accept that as truth. Jesus said, and our mission statement of our church comes from that, this very verse. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other way. If you reject Jesus as your Savior, you reject God's plan. Proud in unbelief and rejection. I see this man, his father. I believe he had unbelief from disappointment. He had brought his son to the disciples in the hopes that he could be helped, and it didn't come through. Now the master comes and says, And if you can do anything, if, if, if it's possible. Your, your disciples couldn't. And I don't know if you can, but if you can, would you do something? You've been disappointed. And sometimes in life it is very hard for us to trust God when we have been disappointed by this world. I think of growing up in the youth group here, and Brother Steve, your, your illustration you gave so many times, we live in a day and age of foblessness. And we have such a hard time trusting God as our Father because we've been disappointed by our earthly fathers. And as a pastor now, I've heard that out of the mouths of people so many times. I've spoken with other pastors and other, other uh, uh, church workers, and that, that, that phrase, that, that theme has come up. We don't understand God as a father because we've not seen a good picture of an earthly father here. Because earthly relationships falter. We've been disappointed by things we can see. We have the hardest time trusting a God that we cannot see. And yet faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. And so we all suffer with doubt. We all struggle there. And so we can all do, number two, what this father did, we all can ask for more faith. We all can ask for more faith. That's what this dad did. He says here, uh, in verse number 24, with tears. I mean, this is, this is amazing. Verse 23, Jesus says, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Now, I'm trying to put my mind in, in, in this dad's position. I'm trying to think, if, if my little boy, if Judson, were in the same situation that this father were in. And he's come to Jesus and said, you know, I've tried, your disciples tried to help me, they didn't, I'm disappointed by that, it, it, it seems to have fallen through. If you can do anything, would you have compassion on us? Can, can you help us? And then Jesus said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe. In that very moment, a little light of hope begins to shimmer again. A little, a little glimpse, just a little bit of hope in his father's heart begins to well up. And he cries out and said with tears. Can you just see the, the, the emotion here? Can you see the broken heart of this dad? He just he says, Lord, I believe. But at the same time, I recognize my, my belief, my faith is not perfect. So please, would you give me 
caress the faith that I gave you. Would you help my unbelief? It's almost like the dad was asking Jesus, before you heal my son's spiritual condition, would you heal mine? Would you give me more faith? Now, for the Christian, we believe everything we have is of God. James says, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above, uh, cometh from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, variableness, neither shadow of turning. In fact, oftentimes, faith is given as a gift from God. One of the gifts of the Spirit given into the church is faith. You see this in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 11. You see it in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. Even faith for salvation, uh, Jesus alludes, is given from God because Jesus said, except the, uh, the Father draw on him, he cannot come to me. <clears throat> nothing we do, nothing we have, can we do without God's help, without God's favor, God's grace. Salvation, we teach, is a gift of God, it is of the grace of God. It's not something we deserve by our virtue or by some honor that we have. It is a gift from God. And if faith is taught in Scripture as a gift from God so often, why can we not ask for more? In fact, I believe the Bible says we should. And that's what it's teaching here. We ought to ask God, God, would you give us more faith? Would you increase our faith? Would you develop us? Would you grow us in this area of faith? In fact, we think of the fruit of the Spirit. And I've alluded to that in Galatians chapter 5. For the fruit of the Spirit... The results of a spiritual life are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. What's the next one? Faith. Meet the temperance. We often pray, Lord, help me to see fruit in my life. We'll pray, God, help me to be more gentle. We'll pray, God, help me to love people more. God, give me, increase my joy. How often do we step back and say, Lord, would you give me more faith? Would you help me to trust you? Sometimes we fear to do that because oftentimes the way God increases our faith is to put us further in a situation of helplessness. We have no choice but to depend on him. But we can ask for more faith. And since we all struggle with doubt, then we all probably at some point in time should be asking God, God, I believe, but help that my unbelief. I see this number three. So number one, we all struggle with doubt. Number two, we can ask for more faith. Number three, faith is the key to God's potential. Faith is the key to God's potential. Jesus said in verse 23, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Let's backtrack. Go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. I alluded to it earlier. But let's go to that chapter. Matthew 17. This is the commissioning of his disciples in this chapter. But he also gives an instruction here. In fact, here in this chapter, we have a retelling of that same story. And he says here to his disciples, after they asked him why we could not cast out that devil, he said to him, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to a yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So he gives this picture here. I, I, I misspoke here. I said this is where the disciples were commissioned. That was earlier in the book. I've got the wrong verse written down earlier. But his disciples are instructed here. In retelling the story, something that Mark left out, Jesus asked this, this idea, he says, if you have the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, not, 
I, I, I have in my office, I should have brought it out, a little bottle that my sister-in-law gave me. It's like this tall. Itty bitty little bottle. And it's full of little brown pellets. I think they're plastic. But they're supposed to be the same size of a mustard seed. It's this itty bitty, I mean, you probably can't even see how far my, my fingers are spread apart. Itty bitty tiny little vial full of, I mean, these things are smaller than an airsoft BB. I mean, they're just tiny. What a, what a powerful illustration that Jesus gives here. He says, if you have faith of that level, you shall be able to say to the mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. You know what we call that? We call that an impossible task. How many have ever seen a mountain move? I mean, just pack up its bags and off it goes. <laughs> Move from play, yonder plays and go off into the sea. We're talking about mountain moving faith. And we use that often in the Christian life, that analogy, we're talking about mountain moving faith. But it wasn't huge faith. It was just a little bit. That's the potential that God places on faith. That God can and will do impossible things if we'll just be willing to take that step out and trust Him. I think of salvation again. Talk about impossible. We go from death to life, an enemy against the kingdom of God, to a child of the king, an heir to the son. Uh, and, uh, I mean, we, 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 we see the transformation of life. That's impossible. A little bit of faith. A little bit of faith. When's the last time you asked the Lord to increase your faith? We look at our church, and we look at the task that's been given to our church. Our job is to reach this community with the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is a daunting task. Because there are many in this community that don't want it. This lost world is getting further and further and further into just absolute, you know, sinful, just, it's falling apart. You can turn on the news every now and then. Actually, don't. Maybe not. It's discouraging. It's hard. We've got a daunting task given to the church as a whole. Reach the world for Christ. How are we going to do it? It's impossible. We need more faith. We need more faith. How are we as this church going to reach this community for Christ? We need more faith. We see people saved, baptized, discipled. Say, how many will that be? I don't know. God asks the church as much as may will be saved. We've just been given a task to preach the gospel. And so we can step out with obedience in that one command that if we preach the gospel, then God's going to bless us. That God's going to work. Because we know his word never returns to him void, but accomplishes whatever he will do with it. So how's your faith? Maybe you need it today. Maybe the says, Lord, increase my faith that I might have some courage to share Christ with my co-workers. Give me more faith that I might be able to have courage to share Christ with my family. Give me more faith that I might have courage to share Christ with my neighbors. That's hard. We want them to like us. We want things to be comfortable. And the gospel, when it's entered in, has this tendency to divide. Saved from lost. Death from life. This, the gospel has this tendency to rile this old world up. But we've been given a chance anyway. I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Let's ask for faith to overcome difficult situations in our life. Let's stand together and have to bow our eyes.